So when you are ready to go, take it away, Aaron. <laughs> we, um, okay, yeah. yeah. The, the unmute button disappeared and then uh, uh, the hotkey for it didn't work. Okay, so unmuted. Can you see my screen and my pointer? Yes. Okay. That looks smaller than usual. Okay. Um, so uh, most of what I'll be talking about has already been touched upon in the previous talks, but uh, most of it bears repeating. Um, so you know, we've at this point we've gone through the the process of designing an experiment. Uh, we've talked about sample preparation methods. This will give a tour of the different ways that we quantify proteins and, and provide a, a table of protein identities and then quantities in, in each sample that we can then pass along to bioinformaticians to give some idea of, you know, what, what are the statistically significant differences, what pathways may be affected. Um, but overall, this, this, since we only have 20 minutes, this, this should be more of a, a tour of the different ways that mass spectrometrists have quantified proteins um, in these experiments. Um, and really just give an overview of these different methods. And, and hopefully it can be a guided discussion more than um, a lecture. So if you have any questions, uh, send them in the chat. That being said, I can't see the chat. So Dennis, uh, could you just uh, let me know if something pops up? You know, so if someone asks what's a spectral count, I can, can chime in. Absolutely. Okay, so you know, over the years, there have been a number of different techniques for quantifying peptides and proteins and mass spectrometry experiments. Uh, and they, they generally boil down into two or a few different uh, topics. One is, are you using isotopic labels of some kind? Um, if so, this would be you know, this set of quantitation methods. Or are you, are you not using uh, isotopic labels? So that would qualify as, as label-free, so not using label quantitation. Um, and then from there, are you quantifying using MS1 data? or MS2 or, or beyond data. So in the case of not using labels and quantifying at the MS1 level, that would be uh, LFQ, which is label-free quantitation, IBAC, which is intensity-based absolute quantitation. Um, so ba based on that breakdown, um, that's the different number of quantitation methods. Um, I will talk a little bit about spectral counting and mostly um, what it is and why we don't tend to use it as much anymore. Um, just to get an idea of um, its historical use. Um, and then I'll, I'll touch upon SILAC and TMT. And if there's time, I can talk about DIA. Uh, and that, that's going to fall in label three MS2 based quantitation, uh, but we're really using the intensity of the MS2 fragments here. Um, I guess would fall under label three MS2. Um, so just a reminder that um, at its core, uh, proteomics is a chromatography experiment. So as, uh, as Mike mentioned, that a typical mouse uh, trypsin digest has more than 2 million uh, peptides uh, in that sample. We'd like to take that very, very complex sample and, and simplify it by passing it into an online uh, C18 grade or online C18 mm -hmm. resin to where we can then separate and simplify that mixture such that at any given moment in time, only a small subset and a few peptides, a few of those two million peptides are eluding into the instrument at a given time. And ideally these would elute for a long enough window that we can see them, detect them and get a good measurement of the, quant of the chromatography profile, but then they disappear um, such that you know, about a minute later we have a different set of peptides. Uh, but in this process, uh, uh, given some, let's say we're in the middle of a, a, uh, of a run, we have a survey scan which identifies or detects multiple different peptides, one of which is shown here uh, with the precursor and isotopic profile annotated. We switch on this and obtain a fragment ion spectrum which we can use to identify this peptide. Really what we're doing is annotating the set of signals more than identifying, um, but we use this to annotate and call this um, a certain peptide. And the way that we assign uh, confidence intervals or confidence levels more than often we're right. 
Um, but that's, this is from one snapshot or one cross section of an experiment. Uh, we can also look at this instead of um, intensity as a function of mass of charge at that one chunk in time. Uh, we can take this and look at it over the retention time window and see that um, over a series of survey scans, one would be here, one would be here. We, this peptide is detectable in um, several of these survey scans. Um, but at one point, we switched on this and obtained a fragment ion spectrum, and we know that this peptide or this uh, ion of mass to charge um, something corresponds to this peptide. Uh, but we can then use the intensity of this MS1 signal over time to measure the quantity of this, uh, and which works rather well. Um, so that's that's the basis of label-free quantitation, IBAC or uh, selected ion monitoring, as Mike uh, discussed earlier. So we, we measure the signal at MS1 as this peptide uh, begins to elute into the instrument, as it reaches its uh, apex intensity, concentration, uh, and then finishes its elution profile. We measure this during sequential MS1 scans and simply sum up those values or integrate over this set of signals that we've annotated uh, to measure it. And when we do this process in uh, controlled experiments, like a serial dilution, we see that the signal, this integrated signal, decreases um, in line with our serial dilutions. So the, the MS1 intensity-based quantitation methods um, work rather well for our high-end instruments. Um, decades ago, before orbit traps, before high-resolution accurate mass instruments, getting this type of signal uh, was much more challenging, as, as Rick uh, may, uh, may mention. So it, at one point, it wasn't really possible to measure the, the accurately measure the signal such that we can obtain a, a, an accurate uh, measurement of quantity. But now we can, so it's, it's one of the preferred methods. Um, and to do this, uh, we typically use MaxQuant. This was developed over a decade ago um, from the Max Planck Institute. Um, in Germany. And this came out of a lab that's um, they're experts in signal processing. They've applied a, uh, a host of algorithms to really extract out this signal and, and provide um, a, a way of quantifying many of these peaks, all of these peaks, uh, in a high throughput fashion. Again, because what we end up with is a very complex uh, mixture of peptides and spectra. So it takes some pretty sophisticated algorithms to, uh, to process this, but we typically use MaxQuant for this, um, for this endeavor. Um, and because they're, they're quite skilled at signal processing and uh, computing or, or programming, they've also extended this capability to be used for SILAC and also TNT quantitation. Um, however, um, so maybe just try a hand at surveying. Has anyone heard of spectral counts? Has anyone used spectral counting um, in, in their experiments? Okay, I'm seeing a few hands, that's, that's good. Um, that's great. So yeah, um, maybe five or so years ago, maybe, maybe seven years ago, this was our go-to method, uh, even though at the time it was, uh, we would say that it's, it, it has its caveats, it's maybe not the preferred method, but it's, for the longest time, it was a, a quick and um, simple readout of the abundance of proteins. Um, but the downside is due to the sensitivity of later generation instruments, um, shown here. So this was a peptide that uh, has a pretty typical elution profile, but we can see that this peptide was detected and switched on at this point in the run um, at 38 minutes at the very beginning onset of the solution profile. And this generated one spectral count. So, and because of dynamic exclusion, um, uh, which is us ignoring this peak for the duration of its solution profile, because if we see this in subsequent MS1 scans, and we've already switched on it and obtained a fragmentation spectrum, we know that we're gonna see basically the same spectrum multiple times if we keep switching on this. So it makes more sense to survey other peptides that are eluding. So what this means is that regardless of the intensity of this peptide, um, if we're doing our jobs right and the chromatography is good, we're going to end up with one spectral count per peptide 
regardless of intensity. Um, so down here, we have a peptide that's a thousand times less abundant that still yields one spectrum count or spectral count um, because it was detected, switched on, and identified. So because the instruments have gotten so sensitive, a thousand times more sensitive, uh, this, this spectral counting method just doesn't scale as well um, with more sensitive instruments. But it still provides a decent readout uh, for some, some experiments. But if you end up in a situation of a protein was detected with two spectral counts in one sample and zero with another, that's a, it, it's a situation that is best avoided. We'd rather use a different quantitation method to answer that question. Um, but in contrast, uh, we also have uh, isotopically, isotopic based quantitation methods. And this is due to the use of isotopes, which uh, this, this slide came from Rennie, who uh, left a year ago to direct the metabolomics core at uh, Children's, but he said that, that, that isotopes are nature's gift to mass spectrometrists. The reason for this is that uh, you can move neutrons around on, on molecules, and assuming that you don't create a uh, radioactive or a, a unstable compound, uh, you can affect the mass of a molecule without affecting any of the other properties. So, and what I'm showing in this panel here are uh, three different isotopically labeled versions of arginine. So the top one is labeled with completely light carbon, uh, carbon 12. Uh, the middle is labeled with carbon 13. And the bottom is labeled with both carbon 13 and or, um, heavy nitrogen. So these are, these have three distinct uh, masses, but are otherwise chromatographically identical. So they elute over the same uh, time, retention time. Their properties are otherwise identical, uh, which is great because if their mass differs and everything else is the same, that's a, that's a great thing for mass spectrometers to work with because we're very good at measuring mass. Um, so we can use this, um, use this property to label cells with isotopically labeled lysine or arginine, uh, because we know that once we digest these with trypsin, um, we'll have at least one lysine or arginine at, at the end of any given peptide. Um, so assuming that the organism in question doesn't have any shunting, me metabol or me me metabolic shunting pathways to turn lysine and arginine into other amino acids um, or convert other amino acids into lysine and arginine, um, barring those, those uh, constraints, we can label uh, in vivo organisms or cells with isotopically light or heavy lysine and arginine, and then mix, uh, mix these samples together. And then in an MS1 scan, we can measure the relative abundance of these peptides in a very direct manner. Um, the nice thing about SILAC is that this can be done in vivo so we don't have the organism, the cells can be alive during this process. So it's amenable to pulse case type experiments or any type of experiment that can be imagined that requires in vivo labeling. Whereas with um, TMT labeling, um, that requires us to lyse the cells, digest into peptides before we can perform this labeling. Um, so uh, the downside of SILAC is that it is quite expensive. And that is what has led to efforts into uh, more feasible ways of labeling uh, protein and peptide samples. Uh, and this started in uh, probably earlier than 1999, but uh, one of the uh, pioneers of isotopic labeling is Steve Eege, uh, who reported this first in 1999, now is at Harvard, uh, developed TNT tags, uh, quite prominent in that uh, field. But the idea is that we can use metabolic or isotopically labeled compounds which have specific reactive groups to label specific moieties of peptides. Um, in this case, it was a thiol specific group uh, with uh, differing amounts of or different isotopically labeled uh, compounds. And he showed that you can, after enriching, with the, enriching the labeled peptides with a biotin tag, you can quantify these. But he showed um, initially that you can isotopically label peptides uh, and quantify the differences. 
uh, since then um, through iterations of better chemistry, better reactive groups, um, uh, molecules with fragments have, have better fragmentation uh, properties. It's led to these tandem mass tags, which are now used very routinely uh, in our labs and in our in our lab and other labs around the world. Um, so th this is the, the modern isobaric tag. This has a, uh, a I think NHS ester or acetaminide group, which is very reactive against primary amines, um, and a mass normalizer region uh, followed by the mass reporter. Um, and this this allows for these tags to have unique reporter ions at the time of quantitation, but are otherwise um, identical in mass. Uh, the reason for this is because of the mass normalizer region. So these are six of the, these are the six TMT sixplex reagents. They have the same number of heavy isotope uh, atoms, so six, which is represented by diamonds. Um, so six uh, heavy labeled, actually, sorry, five, five heavy labeled um, isotopes here, but depending on how many of these are on the mass reporter region versus the mass normalizer gives a different mass of a reporter ion region. So these reagents will uh, be mixed in with a digested uh, peptide sample, which will label primary amines, uh, and this will lead to this attaching onto either the N-terminus or the lysine side chain uh, and then following fragmentation in the mass spec, this will lead to a reporter ion of a different mass. So this would be 126. Since this has an extra isotope, this would be 127. Um, this would be 128. Um, so through a lot of thought of, of chemistry and the use of, of the clever use of chemistry and isotopes, um, we can use these reagents to get a very precise uh, and accurate quantitation method uh, through isotopic labeling. Uh, and this is done either at MS2 or MS3. Um, the reason why we go through the process of doing MS3 quantitation is because peptide samples are complex. You know, if we take a mouse sample, digest it, we have 2 million peptides. Try as we might to resolve this online, there still may be cases where a, a region of the mass to charge window has multiple peptides in the smallest region that we can isolate. This means that we can't actually isolate this specific peptide. We're going to have some, some of this contaminating peptide also co-isolating. And if these are at two different ratios, that's going to distort our, our measurement of the quantity of this one in question. Um, so to get around this, we use something called precurs synchronous precursor selection. Ultimately, we are further purifying the signal by collecting the most abundant ions at MS2 such that we end up with um, a population of ions from our peptide of interest. Uh, and th this has been taken a step further with real-time search. And uh, this is a capability that we have uh, here at UIMS because this is on the latest uh, generation of instruments. Um, so this, this came about from uh, the use of a instrument API, which allows for um, allows for some complex logic to be coded into um, instrument acquisition through the use of uh, C-sharp code. The developer of this API is not on here. It's uh, um, Derek Bailey. He was working at Thermo for a while. He went on to work at Google. But the idea is that you can use an instrument API, put in some, um, encode some logic with C-sharp and then tell the instrument to do some more complex things. And in this case, they applied this idea to um, do real-time search during instrument acquisition and only acquire MS3 spectra if the MS2 um, fragments or MS2 spectra matched a database. The reason is that if we collect MS3 scans on every single peptide that we detect, uh, not all of these are going to match our, our database in question. And this means that it's wasted time during the run of, of collecting MS3 spectra for things that we know aren't going to be uh, in our downstream analysis. So by doing this during the run, we can make much more efficient use of our MS3 acquisition. Uh, and that's something that we can do here at UIMS.
Uh, and when we tried this out with a new instrument, we found that um, this leads to more pronounced fold changes for things that are otherwise subtle uh, without using real-time search. So, and the reason for this is that, let's see, going back. So even though we do this synchronous precursor selection, um, some of these peptide or some of these fragment ions still may be coming from the contaminant um, peptides, but by doing a real-time search and seeing which of these ions are matching to the peptide of interest, we can select for these exact ions knowing that they are part of the peptide in question. And that further um, improves signal specificity. And what we're seeing here is the, a set of samples that were run either on the Eclipse using real-time search or the Lumos uh, without using real-time search. And we have two controls, um, six experimental samples, and then another experimental group in which this effect wasn't seen. Um, and this, this upper part of the heat map shows uh, just more pronounced changes. So we can see the same trend of these proteins are down in the control, up in these cases, and then down. You can still see shades of blue here, shades of somewhat red here, and then more shades of blue, but it's much more washed out. So what we found from this is that we can detect these fold changes much more consistently and from lower levels. Uh, but from there, um, we have some tips on how to set up these TMT experiments, uh, but I think this has been discussed uh, previously, and it's, it's something that we would work out during a consultation. Um, but those are the uh, major methods that are used for protein quantitation and mass spec. Um, we, we also use DIA, but uh, that, that might be a tough one to go through in a few, few minutes. Um, the general idea of DIA is that we use fragment ion data um, at MS2 and integrate over that to do quantitation. But there, there's a little bit more involved in that. And points to consider, these are all things that can be worked out during consultation. And it's, we, we, we've realized over the, the course of these uh, workshops is that a lot of these are on us to figure out um, ultimately what the you know, collaborators interested in is protein quantities in, in samples. So that this is more for us than uh, anyone else. But you know, given these different methods, uh, what we end up with is a, a list or a set of proteins that are identified and then their associated quantities in your samples. Um, and that's what we pass along to the bioinformaticians. Okay, I wanna pause for a moment here. Um, looks like you have a question here. I don't know exactly if this is uh, for Aaron. Can you read that? Is it possible oh, to yeah. apply the RT? Yeah, um, so that's, that's the benefit, but also the, the caveat of, of using real-time search is you have to go in and you have to acquire the data knowing exactly what to look for. So if you use the wrong database um, when setting up this real-time search, and by the way, that the, this function is in the, the tune interface. So when we set up our run, when we tell the mass spec how we want it to acquire the data, um, we, we put in that we want to use real-time search, and this is the FASTA database that we want to use um, to, to match up the mass spec signals to the database. We also specify some parameters like mass error, any modifications. So, yeah, the, you, you have to know from the start what database to use and what type of modifications to look for. So there, there are some, some limitations. Uh, it's we tend not to use it for modifications just because that leads to this explosion of, of search space. Many modifications are positional isomers, so we might actually be, uh, yeah, there, there's some challenges with uh, modified peptides, but for unmodified ones, it, it works rather well. 